Merlin Glenn. I'm a technical product manager at VMware. And today we're going to be doing a whiteboard session on PCF, our Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and vSphere. And this is going to be the first of a, a two-part or a two-session lightboard series. So before we can really get into how does vSphere interact with Cloud Foundry or Pivotal Cloud Foundry, we really need to talk about what is Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So Cloud Foundry is based all around applications. It's all about the app. So we're going we're gonna to overview and understand exactly what Cloud Foundry does for us, what it does for our applications. And every application is going to start with your developer. And that developer is going to have a framework, um, a, a, a language that that application is written in. And Cloud Foundry supports multiple languages, um, Node, Go, Java. So in this Lightboard series, we'll kind of focus on a Java sample or Java uh, example. So they'll have their code base. And that's... Java, um, what they need to do with that code is they need to have it a version control. They need to have it checked in somewhere. And this is so that we can build a pipeline, so we can build an automated way to deliver applications. This is, this is a really uh, core cloud-native uh, CI, CD, or continuous integration, continuous development concept. And so we'll have that, that source code checked into a source repository. And that could be something like Git, SVN, Perforce, it gets probably one of the most prevalent or popular. Um, now, once, once our application code has been checked into a source repository, it has to be built. And there'll be another component of your pipeline, building your application, building the actual artifacts. And this could be done something like Jenkins, uh, Bamboo, Concourse. So the whole purpose of, of building our pipeline building is to automate when a, an application is being developed, the check-in of the code, uh, once it's been checked in, it builds and an artifact is produced. And in our case, since we're talking about a Java application, it could be a jar file or it could be a war file. So we have a war file that's been output as an artifact of our pipeline. So now here's where Cloud Foundry comes in. So this process is, is largely a uh, you know, largely a process external to Cloud Foundry. So what does Cloud Foundry actually do for us in this case? Well, I need some place to run that application. So what Cloud Foundry is, is a logical collection of services that provide a platform for me to run my application so I could take my artifacts, my built artifacts and my pipelines and run them in a stable, consistent, and fault-tolerant manner. So that's what Pivotal Cloud Foundry does for me. And the way this is done is that same pipeline that's instantiated from when the developer checks in their code to a source repository can also push, um, which is the term that is used to actually send an artifact into the Cloud Foundry environment. It can actually push that artifact into Cloud Foundry. And what happens is, is Cloud Foundry will take that artifact and run through a process called staging. And that stage process it's really going to take that artifact and combine it with a couple of things to make us an image uh, that can be run as a container inside of the Cloud Foundry's container technology, which is called Diego. So that staging process is going to take two key components. Uh, one of those components is a root file system. So we're going to get a root file system, or it's typically Linux, so even though Cloud Foundry is capable of running a .NET application. In our normal staging process, we're just talking about a Java app that's going to be a traditional Java app on Linux, and so we're going to get a root file system. In addition, um, that WAR file needs something like TC server. It needs, a, it needs an execution component um, to now enable us to actually run the application. So Cloud Foundry has one or more build packs that will actually detect what the type of artifact is. If this were a Go artifact, it would link it to a Go build pack with all the Go libraries. If it were, since it's a WAR artifact, it's going to link it to a Java build pack with all the Java libs and TC server to execute this application. And what's going to happen is it's going to combine the artifact with these two components. And at the end of the stage process, we're going to have an application that can run, or an application instance. So we'll call that an AI. And this instance is, in effect, a container. And it's run by the component I mentioned earlier of Cloud Foundry. It's run by something called Diego. 
And we won't really go into, into details of Diego's architecture. Uh, we'll do that for another Lightboard series. But suffice to say, this is the component that's going to schedule running our application instances or our containers, which are components of our app across our cloud platform. Now, in addition to actually running the containers, Cloud Foundry gives us a, a pretty expansive routing layer, meaning that I can actually bind a route to this application. So I could just call this myapp.foo.com. Now, it's, it's not just, uh, so this is, this is a, um, a run through of what a traditional cloud native um, staged application, how the process of it running takes place inside of Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry also has the capability to run Docker images. Now, Docker images are slightly different. It's, you have to sort of reverse the order of what's happening. Because in a Docker image, our image is, in essence, already staged. It's already composed. Um, so in most cases, if we take our Docker image, and remember, we're talking a Docker image here. Uh, Cloud Foundry doesn't necessarily run Docker or Docker Engine in the back end. Uh, it runs Diego to instantiate its containers and schedule them. But it can take a Docker image, a composed Docker image, um, and run it and schedule it just like any of the other applications that are pushed inside of Cloud Foundry. The thing that's different with a Docker image is, is what I'm talking about here is you'll typically have something called a source to image pipeline or a pipeline that will take uh, all of our source and artifact components and compose them similar to what's happened here in our stage process in Cloud Foundry and compose them to give us a Docker image in the endpoint. So you'd actually have the same WAR file that we output in our earlier stages of our pipeline fit into our source to image pipeline and get us our Docker image. And after we have a Docker image, the push process is largely the same. Uh, we just push our Docker image in. We don't have to go through the same staging process. It's a slightly, it's a, it's a, a very smaller process to be able to get the Docker image in and composed and ready to execute inside of Diego. But we wind up with the same thing at the end. We wind up with an application instance. Uh, and in this case, that application instance can be, um, you know, my back-end service. If I'm developing a cloud-native application, this can wind up being service1 or microservice1.foo.com. So inside of Cloud Foundry, uh, there's a lot of other components besides just running the applications and routing to the applications. We also want to have the ability to make sure these application instances um, at least maintain some level of availability. So if we suffered fa failures inside of our physical infrastructure that's uh, hosting Cloud Foundry, how do we make sure that these application instances stay online? So you can scale applications um, inside of Cloud Foundry to multiple AIs. So this one logical application of myapp.foo.com, um, I may want three instances. Uh, and those, it serves two roles. It's not just for high availability, but also scalability. I may have a large number of front-end requests coming in to this application, so I need to scale it to handle that load. Uh, in addition, I may want to keep my services, my back-end services are very lightly accessed. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe I don't need three application instances of that service for scale um, issues, but I want to maintain availability, so I'll at least put a second application instance up. And what Cloud Foundry does is it has a construct called an availability zone. And we're going to go ahead and in this light board, we're going to go ahead and use three availability zones because that's a, a best practice within Cloud Foundry to assign three availability zones. Um, these availability zones maintain a, an application's uptime if a physical fault occurs in the infrastructure that's back in Cloud Foundry. Um, if AZ1 were to go down, we would still have remaining AZ2 and AZ3 for application instances to be able to stay up. So how has how is this worked out? Well, so back in Cloud Foundry is an IaaS. So we'll draw our IaaS here. Of course, we're going to focus in part two of the series on this being a vSphere IaaS. Although Cloud Foundry, as we'll discuss a little bit of the architecture, uh, can support multiple platforms. Uh, we're going to focus on vSphere for these Lightboard sessions. So 
We've got an IaaS. We've got VMs that are actually providing these services or instances, depending on the cloud platform that you're running Cloud Foundry. So each of these VMs is going to be performing a certain job or jobs inside of Cloud Foundry. Um, and so there's a component called Bosch. And so Bosch will actually create and assign jobs or roles to these instances or VMs. In particular types of jobs, for example, the routing components, you know, what allows Cloud Foundry to be able to say, hey, when I get a request for myapp.foo.com, where does, where does it go? Um, those routing components are going to be spread across our availability zones. So we're just putting GR for Go Router here. And using this construct, Bosch ensures that we have our jobs spread across physical fault domains. So if we do ha incur a physical failure in our backing infrastructure for Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry can still function and our application instances still stay up. Now, how does Bosch work? Uh, it's a key thing for a, a vSphere admin to understand because Bosch is an integral part. So we can almost look at Bosch as a, as a control plane component of PCF. So we can call this PCF control plane. And when you're deploying PCF, you have two key virtual machines. These are going to be VMs, and they're going to be single instance VMs, uh, Bosch and Ops Manager. So we'll just call that Ops Man. Uh, now, Bosch, uh, as we said, actually makes sure that these Bosch instances are instantiated and maintained. Now, the way it does that is it talks to our IaaS control plane. And so we are going to be talking about vCenter because this is vSphere. So we've got vCenter running on one side here. Uh, Bosch is actually going to communicate with vCenter through something called a CPI. And it's a cloud provider interface. And so the CPI is actually how Bosch is going to create all of these VMs, right? So we have our CPI communication channel between Bosch and vCenter. Now, it's not just uh, the task of creating the VM objects or creating the instances uh, based upon your cloud provider. But once these instances are created, I need to assign these special jobs to them. I need to assign these special roles so they can provide all these higher level services inside of Cloud Foundry. So Bosch does that communication through an agent. So every VM that's instantiated will actually have an agent communication path back to Bosch. So that it can determine the health. If a Go router for some reason goes offline or has a fault or has a failure, Bosch can actually resurrect or rebuild that. So it gives us a fault tolerant underpinning of the infrastructure that's actually providing our higher level services. Now Bosch, um, Bosch does this by, by taking answers or manifests, these are usually YAML manifests, um, that dictate where, is our, where, are our or where are our cloud abstractions, where are our vSphere resources, what are our networks, what are, our, what are all the underpinnings, what are the infrastructure that we need to map these higher level services to. And to generate these manifests, it's a very uh, cumbersome process. Um, so Pivotal has done a really great job to make that easy for us. So that's what Opsman is. Opsman is another VM that gives us a graphical interface for an operator. That's thus the name Operations Manager. And that allows the operator to go in and, and configure how Cloud Foundry is going to be deployed and also maintain it in a day two scenario where updates have to occur, uh, CVEs have to be applied to the environment. So uh, the pair of Ops Manager and Bosch are really key. Uh, and not only does, does Bosch and Ops Manager provide pivotal Cloud Foundry for us to run the applications, but there's also the concept of, a, of services. So Pivotal will call these service tiles. And what these are, are these are, another, these are other implementations of services that, are, that our applications may need that are going to be instantiated by Bosch across our IaaS. So we can have services like MySQL or Rabbit, RabbitMQ. Um, and even, you know, it, you don't have to limit yourself to services that are managed by Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry really wouldn't be an extensible platform if that were the case. So um, even if we have external data 
that we have to access. So what if we have mainframe data or uh, other, other vendor external SQL backends or other queue services, uh, other NoSQL databases, things that are not managed by Bosch inside our platform, we need the ability to be able to access those. And so there's a, there's a layer of Cloud Foundry called the Service Broker Layer. And what that allows us to do, or what allows a Cloud Foundry to do, is take an application and bind that application to the services that it may require, like our front end may need to access MySQL, uh, as well as our, our MQ data. Uh, in addition, our back end may also need to access the MQ data and maybe some, some other external data. We also have services, because this is, remember Cloud Foundry is for a microservices type architecture, it's for cloud native applications. We can also have scenarios where these two apps are interdependent services of each other, so we could have our front end consuming our back end. So this is, uh, this is an overview of what is Cloud Foundry, you know, what, what's the benefit of running Cloud Foundry? We could see that it's a, it's, a really, it's a really powerful platform for us to put into our development scenarios where cloud native applications, the artifacts, are given to the platform, and the platform handles all the heavy lifting of how do I, how do I get my runtime together? How do I get my routing together? How do I secure? How do I log? Um, in, our, in our next session, part two of this, these Lightboard sessions, we're going to go a little deeper into how do we, how do we actually have vSphere provide uh, the key services it needs to to keep Cloud Foundry running optimally, um, but we'll also go into more of how do we, how do we deal with external requirements from Cloud Foundry like monitoring and logging. So I hope you've enjoyed this Lightboard session and check out uh, part two of two. Thank you. Thank you.